Morning, children. Are we on? We good? Yep, cool. It's good to see you all again. Let me ask you a question. Have you guys ever gotten in a fight with one of your brothers or sisters or friends at school? Yes? Really? It's not just me then. Oh, man, I used to get in fights with my brothers all the time, and I was the smaller, so I always lost. But today, in the Bible, we're going to be hearing about a brother called Joseph. We've been hearing about Brother Joseph for a while now. And we're going to be hearing about how Joseph has what's called reconciliation, which is a big fancy word, which means he makes up with his brothers after they've fought. Now, the funny thing is, it's a little bit hard for us to understand, but the funny thing is, even though they've had a big fight, and even though we have fights with our brothers and sisters, God is glorified by us being reconciled or making up and forgiving each other after our fights. And so what was really bad, having a fight with our brothers and sisters, all of a sudden becomes good because we go to our brother and sister because they punched us in the eye or broke a piece of wood over our back or whatever it is. Oh, you guys don't do that, though, way. Eh? Yeah, that's right. And, and they say to us, you know, I'm really sorry for hurting you like that. I'm really sorry for breaking that toy. And we say, you know, I forgive you because God forgave me. And I love you still, even though you did that to me. And God is honored and God is glorified because of that. And so what was bad all of a sudden becomes good. And this is true because of the gospel. The gospel says that we can be forgiven by God and therefore we can forgive other people. Isn't that great? That you don't have to stay angry with your brothers and sisters. You don't have to stay angry with a kid at school because he beats you up or steals your toy or steals your lunch. But you can forgive him because God's forgiven you. And the wonderful news is that God has forgiven you guys. That Jesus Christ died so that you can be forgiven. And therefore, you can forgive other people as well. Don't hold on. Don't hold on when, when people do mean things to you. You know, Joseph in the story, he had every ability and power to make really bad things happen to his brothers for what they did. But he forgave them because he realized that he had the love of God and how could he not show that love to someone else? Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you that you've loved us. We thank you that you've loved these children and that your son would die for the smallest of little babies. We thank you for your covenant, which extends your love not just to adults, but to children. And Lord, we just pray that you would help all of us, both children and adults, to forgive people, to be reconciled, to make up after having fights with people, and just to show the love of God to everyone. Lord, would you watch over these children and help us as a big family here to care for them and show them what Jesus Christ looks like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. As Logan says, our reading is from Genesis 45. And I'm going to read the whole chapter from verse 1 to 28. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptian heard, that the Egyptian heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. 
Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still, alive, still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him, but they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be blowing, there will be no, there will be not be blowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now, hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and heads and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt, and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are also directed to tell them, do this, take some cards from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings because the best of all Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them cards as Pharaoh had commanded, and he, and he also gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them, he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. 
and this is what he sent to his father. Ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away. And as they were leaving, he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Uh, Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph has said to them, and when he saw the cards Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Well, we're back in Genesis again this morning. Uh, Genesis 45. There are Bibles available up here if you would, uh, if you need one to follow along in the message this morning. And I've entitled the chapter, chapter 45 this morning, Reconciliation. Reconciliation with an exclamation mark. We have been following the story of Joseph now for a number of chapters in Genesis. And we were introduced to him as a young teenager and who was in fact subject to bullying by his older brothers who treated him shamefully and, uh, and selling him in slavery to Egypt they never really expected ever to see him again. And we have followed uh, the, the adventures of Joseph and uh, his ups and downs in Egypt and now he's been exalted to the highest place and his brothers have turned up on the scene and uh, the moment of reconciliation has arrived in chapter 45. It's a, it's a chapter of powerful human drama. I appreciated what Logan said in the children's talk that, that in fact... Uh, Disagreement among siblings is endemic to the human race. Parents despair at times over their children squabbling, but it can't be avoided. It must happen. Like pebbles in a tin being rattled around and banging against each other, so are children growing up in a family. Parents are the bones on which children sharpen their teeth. And we bear the scars in our hearts, our lifelong. So it's inevitable, you see, that reconciliation must be a constant and ongoing reality in our families and in our churches. Lest the inevitable squabbling that comes on account of sin drives us apart. So this chapter is a hugely wonderful heartwarming chapter of what God can do to bring warring brothers together. The moment of reconciliation had arrived. Joseph had heard in the previous two chapters, Joseph had heard Judah's pleas on behalf of his younger brother Benjamin. Pleas which had indicated there had been a heart change in his elder brother. Judah would not abandon Benjamin to slavery in Egypt the way he had abandoned Joseph all those years ago. 
20 years ago. It's a heart change in Judah, which meant that that Joseph's self-disclosure now in chapter 45 would result in rejoicing and reconciliation rather than further accusations, denials, and hatred among the brothers. Furthermore, it was a reconciliation that meant the brothers could return back to the old man Jacob with the good news of a reconciliation that the whole family could rejoice in and and praise God for what he had done. God had done the impossible. He had changed hearts. He had reconciled brothers. See, this is what happens when warring parties are reconciled. Many others are blessed. Like the widening ripples we see when a stone is thrown into a pond. So the ripples go out and the blessing of reconciliation goes out and affects the lives of many. Well, if you have your Bibles open, uh, I don't have mine open. Here we go. Genesis 45. Verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. That self-identification. I am Joseph. Lest there be any doubt, I am the one you sold into Egypt. You see, when we see Joseph's tears here, weeping in verse 2, we realize, you see, that Joseph has carried the burden of what his brothers had done to him for a long time. And it was a heartbreaking burden for him to realize that he had been banished and rejected and thrown out of the family and cast adrift in a foreign and strange world. And now... That burden was lifted, and the relief for Joseph was immense, that he could be reconciled again with his brothers and with his father and with his family. An emotionally charged scene indeed. A separation of 20 years was about to come to an end. Joseph had all the Egyptians in the room uh, leave, Perhaps it would not have been a good look for his servants to see the second in the kingdom in such distress before these Hebrew herdsmen. Alone now with his brothers, Joseph broke down, weeping loudly and proclaiming, I am Joseph! I am Joseph! (laughs) Could you imagine what that was like for the brothers to hear that? This man who sits on this throne with all his Egyptian regalia, speaking an Egyptian language, waited on by Egyptian servants, the second only in the kingdom to Pharaoh, the one who can say to the whole of the nation, do this and do that. I am Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. No wonder they were terrified. Joseph now had the power to deal to them, to make them pay for what they had done. For the brothers, this was totally unexpected. They thought that having bought Benjamin, which was the requirement, they could just quietly get their grain and go on back home to Jacob. But now their whole world was turned upside down. It was frightening and terrifying for them. Perhaps this man was going insane. 
How could he know about Joseph? How could this Egyptian potentate know about Joseph? The name of their long-lost brother has never been mentioned in his presence. And who else but them knew about the sale of their brother Joseph into Egyptian slavery? And this man seemed to know it all. And what's more, he was claiming to be their long-lost brother. It took a lot of explaining on Joseph's part, but they were finally convinced. Verse 5. And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will not be ploughing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance, or to save you as a great band of survivors. Verse 8, So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. It was not you who sent me to Egypt, but God. These are some very, very powerful words, aren't they? What's instructive here for us and for the brothers was the direction that Joseph took in his explanation. Yes, he said, you did sell me into Egyptian bondage. You did that. But in reality, it was not you, but God himself who brought me to Egypt ahead of you. It was all God's doing. For the saving of many lives, including the saving of many Egyptian lives. The saving of many lives. For the saving of the lives of all those from the surrounding nations who would come to Egypt to buy grain. It was for the saving and the blessing of nations that God has brought me here. You see what uh, Joseph was testifying to? That God had raised up a son of Israel to be a blessing to the nations. One who would rule in wisdom for the preservation of life. That by the word of God and by the servant of God, the mercy of God would be known to the nations during the time of this famine. That by the word of God and by the servant of God, Joseph, the mercy of God would be made known to the nations. How's that for perspective on selling Joseph into slavery? Wow, that's a transcendental perspective and understanding. We also learn in this little short speech that the seven-year famine was only two years old. There were five more years of famine to come. You know, in all the astonishment of Joseph's self-disclosure, the brothers seem to have missed the startling fact that Joseph knew how long this famine would last. <laughs> how could anybody know that? How could anyone possibly know that? Well, Joseph had a prophetic gift. It was a word of prophecy that he was speaking. Well, you see, with five years still to go, there was no way Jacob and his family could survive unless Egypt made it possible. It was a remarkable statement of prophecy from Joseph. It was nothing less than prophetic insight into the mind of God. With five years left to go, there was no hope for Jacob and his family. If they remained in the land of Canaan, they would perish. We see that at the end of verse 11. Throughout the book of Genesis, there have been many threats and dangers to the plan of God being accomplished through the descendants of Abraham. In fact, the whole account of the patriarchs is really an account of how Threat after threat and danger after danger arose to the promises God had made, and in every case, God overcame them. 
In chapter 12, there was the call to Abraham and the promises of land and blessing and descendants, but immediately dangers and threats to these promises arose. Sarah was unable to have children. Abraham, on account of his lies and deception, kept losing Sarah to the harems of eastern despots. God had to deliver her. Ishmael himself was a threat to the chosen son and heir. And so was Abraham himself on Mount Moriah when his knife was raised over his son, his only son, the one whom he loved. And Isaac had only two sons who became bitter enemies. And the son who was chosen by God had to flee for his life and was subject for many years to all kinds of deception and deprivation until finally he returned to the land of promise where he could raise his 12 sons. And at every turn of the story, God was there to see every threat overcome and deliver his chosen ones and keep the promise alive. So now, with the promise of descendants that was first given to Abraham back in chapter 12, was that now being realized and fulfilled at long last with Jacob and his 12 sons settled in the land, Jacob, the man of God's choosing, in the land of God's choosing, with the 12 sons already to adult, mature, ready to marry and reproduce and multiply and have countless grandchildren, was God's promise of many descendants finally about to be realized. Just when it seemed that the promise of descendants was finally locked in, a seven-year famine came along that threatened to wipe out the whole family. The greatest threat of all, of all those threats in the book of Genesis, here was the greatest one, where not one of them would survive a seven-year-old famine. It appeared they had no means of surviving the famine if they remained in Canaan. No reserves of food. Since in the first year of the famine, they had to go to Egypt to buy grain. And here in the second year of the famine, they were coming back to buy more grain. How were they going to survive seven years? Their nomadic lifestyle meant they had no access to stored grain reserves. And the seven-year famine would decimate their flocks and herds. Their situation was indeed dire. And how was God to rescue them from this greatest of all threats? The answer to that question is totally surprising, astonishing, and unbelievable. God would deliver them by having the brothers sell Joseph into Egyptian slavery for a few silver coins, then lie and cover it up for 20 years until the time came for their deliverance. <laughs> That's how God was going to do it. Isn't that amazing? So there, you see, when they pulled Joseph as a, as a, what, a 17-year-old out of that dry pit and, and sold him to the Midianites, that was God's plan to save the whole family from deprivation and poverty. That was part of God's plan. You see that as events transpired, the result would be a great deliverance and a saving of many lives. You see, we shouldn't miss the fact that in verse 5 and verse 7, Joseph says twice that God has sent him to Egypt ahead of them. Ahead of them. Joseph understood what was happening here that the seven-year famine was designed by God to get Jacob and his family to Egypt where they could become a great nation. He was the first one, and all the others would follow and experience a great salvation. This was God's intention, to overcome the threat the famine posed to this family. He would preserve them, as it were, a remnant from the famine. The idea of a remnant is that of a few who survive a great catastrophe. See that in verse 7? But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance or to save you as a band of 
survivors. God was going to deliver them from the disaster of the famine and in doing so, God would also deliver this family from the lies and deceit that had threatened for many years to break them apart. So God wasn't only going to save their lives from dying in a famine, he was also going to save this family from the lies and the deceit and the recriminations and the warring and the fighting. God isn't just going to save their bodies, he's going to save their hearts. <laughs> it's no use bringing them down to Egypt, still fighting and squabbling. He was going to do two things here. He was going to restore them physically and he was going to restore them in their hearts and restore their love for one another. Joseph goes on to say that it was God who has elevated him in the land of Egypt, not Pharaoh. Verse 9. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Joseph is testifying here to God's hidden providence. God's hidden providence throughout the account of Joseph is now coming to light. Many times through this account, we, the reader, and perhaps Joseph himself, have wondered where the hand of God was in all of this. The pit, Potiphar, prison, palace. What was God doing in all of this? Now at the end, we see God's hand at every turn to guide his people and accomplish his purpose for the saving of many. Well, <clears throat> such was Joseph's standing with the Pharaoh. After all, Joseph had saved Egypt from destitution and famine. The Pharaoh was willing to make all kinds of provision for Joseph's family. So with those provisions loaded onto their carts, off they went, verse 25. And so they went out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. The brothers had been convinced. Now they had to convince their father. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Jacob was stunned. His heart became numb. The grace of God is too much. Is your, ever, is your heart ever struck dumb and numb and stunned? before the magnitude of the grace of God in your life? The grace of God is too much, isn't it? Sometimes it's more than our hearts can bear. But once old Jacob had been convinced, he did not hesitate. He would go immediately to Egypt to see his son Joseph. You see Joseph's wisdom here. By Joseph's insistence that this was all God's doing, he blunted any recriminations against the ten brothers who had sold him into slavery in Egypt. As the truth is revealed, as Jacob learns about what had happened to Joseph all those years ago, Joseph's insistence that it was all God's doing would have meant that even the telling of the account to the brothers and to Jacob would have drawn them together around what God was doing in the family rather than heighten their divisions. They were being united, you see, around an understanding of what God was doing in all of our hearts and drawing us together. So the eventual reconciliation might be on the basis of what God was doing for them all. So their testimony could be, as they looked at their family now united again, look what God has done for our family. Well, as we gather here this morning, we acknowledge, don't we, that we worship a God 
who does not change from age to age in the way he deals with his people and the way he works out his one unified plan of salvation. His hidden providence is always at work in our lives to overcome every threat to our salvation, every incident in our lives where we may have looked in vain for evidence of God at work. One day we will be able to proclaim with confidence as we look back that God did it all. God did it all to preserve me and a great number of people for the praise of his name. And how will God do that? How will God do that? Well, the answer to that question is totally surprising, astonishing and unbelievable. From among his servants, the prophets, who have suffered down through the centuries for their prophetic gift, God would raise up one who would be the fulfillment of both the prophetic office and the prophetic message. One who would be the final and greatest prophet, his very own son, his only son, the one whom he loved, the one that all of Scripture has been preparing us for, and no sooner had the promised son been born than there were threats to his very survival. King Herod sought to kill him. And so like Jacob, he had to flee to Egypt for survival. And when Jesus returned to the land of Israel and began to fulfill his public ministry, his very life was under threat. His own countrymen, his brothers, sought at every turn to trap him, discredit him, and to eventually betray him and all for a few silver coins. But God was at work, you see. And the very efforts of these murderers to kill the favorite son of God became the very means by which God preserved for himself a remnant on earth. Because the death of Christ at the hand of murderers and betraying brothers became the sacrifice of for our sins, in order to preserve for himself a remnant on earth of a people of God who would be his and who would experience a great deliverance and a mighty salvation, bringing many survivors to eternal life when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the one who has gone ahead of us to provide a way of deliverance. And we have followed after in order to be reconciled with the Father. A reconciliation made possible by the suffering of the Son. You see, my friends, all of this brings our own Christian lives into focus, doesn't it? When we read this wonderful account of Joseph. We too have received promises from God. We too have been given great assurances that God is at work to fulfill these promises, but we too are confronted with threats that conspire against our faith in God's promises. You consider all the things that have happened in your life that have made you stop and wonder, is God really good? Is God really powerful? Why are these things happening to me? The world culture in which we are immersed in which our children are immersed, our weak and untrustworthy flesh, and the devil himself, all conspire against us, all conspire against our faith. Where is God when we most need him? Will these threats be overcome? As you sit here this morning, are you wondering, will my faith remain as the years go by? Will I continue to believe in Jesus and to trust him? Will there be perseverance among God's people? Will the church survive in a world that battles against the church and seeks to silence its prophetic voice? And to every question and to every doubt comes the assurance of the ages. Just as God has intervened in the past, so he will continue to intervene in the present and in the future to preserve for himself a remnant here on earth. 
And we will be able to look black like Joseph did and proclaim, proclaim confidently that all of it was by God's hand. He has brought us through. Just as he kept Jesus Christ and brought him through those fiery trials, so he will bring us through. So where is your faith this morning, my friends? Where is your faith? Has the um, experience of, of heartache and disagreement and discord among brothers and sisters, has it weakened and diminished and eroded your faith, the difficulties and the disappointments of this life threatened to overcome your faith with doubts about the goodness and the love of God toward you. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If we do not believe, then we have no reason to be confident that we will stand on the day of judgment, the greatest and final threat of all, that will finally come. The good news is that the Lord in his goodness and grace continues to hold out to each of us this morning the joy of reconciliation with the Father. Because there is a son endowed with the gift of prophecy who suffered on our behalf to reconcile us with the Father. If you come believing with a repentant spirit, then a broken and a contrite heart he will not despise. So in spite of all the difficulties you experience in life and will continue to experience, we can say confidently on the basis of these scriptures, as the Holy Spirit echoes that message and affirms it to our hearts, we must not let our hearts be hardened. We must not let our love grow cold. Because Jesus Christ has promised to be with us, to love us, to watch over us, and to bring us finally with joy back to the Father's house. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that that which is most important is most clear in Scripture. We thank you, Father, that you have gone to such, such lengths to reconcile us to yourself. We thank you that in the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have a hope that is alive for us today as it was back then. We thank you, Father, that as we look down through the ages of redemptive history and see how you have intervened again and again to watch over and protect and preserve your people and to fulfill your promises in their lives, so we step out now with confidence on those promises, trusting in Jesus Christ. But Father, we pray. That as we come with faith into your presence, it would be with a broken and a contrite heart. A heart that are repentant over the sin. That has obscured our view of Jesus Christ and have blunted our faith in the promises that are ours in him. We pray, Father, that this morning you would bring us to a greater, a greater love for Jesus Christ a greater desire to follow him and to glorify him with our lives and to serve him and to be known as one of his. And Father, we look forward to that day when we can stand in your presence, reconciled with you, with our bridegroom there, singing over his bride with rejoicing because all the threats have been turned aside and we stand in your presence, delivered, redeemed, and rejoicing. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.